There was a lot about dialogue in the past three presentations, or at least in two of them, and that I'll add to that. Um, and it's about building alliances today, that that's the topic of the day, and I think I'll perhaps add, add a thing to that. Um, it was quite striking for me to not see any um, papers on migration mm. or refugees, mm. uh, except for mine. Um, <laughs> but then the topic ran through the conference because I think George Callis raised it in, in, the, um, in the, the first um, panel. And sort of like people have picked up on the topic and mentioned it again and again. And Ashish Kotari just uh, also spoke about well, the, the need for there not being any xenophobic um, elements in, in alternatives to development. Um, yeah, so I'm happy about that. Um, and I would will add uh, something to the points raised uh, regarding migration and degrowth uh, thus far, because I think it's been raised as a social movement in the sense of people migrating. And I'll add to that uh, by um, highlighting a refugee activism, so the political movement. Um, and it's, I didn't know that beforehand um, when I started to think about this, uh, this topic, and it's very new to me, so this is really preliminary thoughts. But at the Degrowth Summer School and the Climate Camp in the Rhineland that took place last week, um, the topic was actually very present. And I don't know if it's a German thing. Um, because German people organized it, more or less, um, uh, these events. But there were refugee activists at the conference also giving keynote speeches. And um, one of the topics uh, was breaking hegemony, um, how to think about neoliberalism and racism. So uh, there's something going on there at the moment. Um, yeah, this slogan um, has been used by uh, refugee activists for about 20 years in, in, in Germany. Um, and it highlights global inequality and interconnectedness of, of North and South in more, quite a vivid way, I think. Uh, it's still uh, present in the refugee movement, um, but I sort of had the feeling um, that it's necessary to look beyond the slogan. What's, what uh, is refugee activism actually doing to address or to understand um, issues of global inequality? And I think this... Um, might contribute to the degrowth um, debate in a certain way, not necessarily to the ecological aspect, but to the aspect of uh, social inequality that has been um, raised um, again and again in, in this conference. Um, so what I find, found surprising is that there's actually very little dialogue between anti-post-colonial critique and degrowth. I found this surprising. Mm -hmm. So it's always brought up, but it's not really delved into. Mm -hmm. And um, a few people have, have started to do, uh, to do that. I think Escobar as well, and mm -hmm. also the people from Barcelona um, have started doing that. Um, and I think a refugee activism is actually quite an interesting lens to, um, oh, sorry, to, to approach this um, issue because it's um, sort of bringing out the global north in the south. Um, so this might provide a useful lens um, to, to, to bring these perspectives into dialogue. Um, and third, of course, um, that's my interest, and I'm actually more come more from the activist side. I'm very new to migration, refugee um, issues uh, from an academic angle, um, is to explore possibilities of solidarity between these struggles. Um, I've wanted to, of course, interview people, and do participant observation, and all these kind of necessary things. I've only managed to look at documents thus far. Um, and I've taken documents from um, the beginning of the 90s until um, today from a few organizations and initiatives and networks um, from the self-organized um, refugee um, struggle in Germany. Um, that has been sort of my main problem. How do I frame it theoretically? I'm still very unsure about it. Might, maybe you've got some... Uh, might be able to help me. Um, I think it's, well, it's, you know how it goes, you look at the empirical material and you go back to your theory and you try and sort of find out how they might uh, speak to, to each other in a uh, constructive way. And I thought that, to, well, uh, looking at degrowth, I think the aspect of redistribution 
that's mentioned as key to degrowth um, is a valid um, point of departure for, for refugee activism, and you'll see why. And of course, the aspect of social justice. And De Maria and Al say that um, degrowth implies an equitable redistribution of wealth across the global north and south. And this, I think, is where refugee activism um, might come in. Um, of course, migration in itself can be already seen as curbing global inequality, but that's not what I'm concerned with in this, in this paper. It's more the political demands coming from the refugee um, movement. And I went back to some uh, interesting German um, scholars. Um, Christa Wichterich was just mentioned, um, sort of that time. <laughs> And these people who uh, really thought uh, a lot about internationalism, about solidarity, especially in the 80s <coughs> and 90s. And I'm very, um, I'm, I would have liked to have lived in these times. They seem to have been very inspiring intellectually and politically. And there, a, a guy called Christoph Speer came up with the concept of de-development. And I found that quite a, an interesting concept. It's called Abwicklung in, in, in German. And, um, well, it was basically to counter the sustainability discourse and say this is basically the, the next hegemonic um, attempt well, to, to continue as with business as usual. And um, he says that we actually have to look at, uh, if you look at North-South solidarity, what's the role of the North? And the role of the North or activism in the North would be to actually de-develop, which means to um, reduce military capacities to be, um, for interventions in the South, to also push back the global economic sector, which also means to reduce the possibility of the North to uh, appropriate labor in the South and resources. And um, then you've also got the aspect of autonomy in the North. He also speaks about reappropriating re land and, and, and resources in the North, um, and also to, to start looking at food provision in the North, which uh, Ashish Kotari had also talked about. Like, um, sort of providing food wherever you are or, or producing. Um, the third strand, uh, current that um, I think would be interesting uh, to take into account is post-development, which has been mentioned several times now, and uh, the anti-globalization movement, the idea of decentering development, Western ideas of development. Um, and the fourth one, um, post-anti-colonial critique. And I, within this uh, research, I found it I sort of had the impression that I go, go back uh, in time more, <laughs> more and more. So I go back to, to people like Fanon and Walter Rodney, um, like really sort of damning critiques of exploitation and global inequality. And I think they're very useful to, to, to take into account, even though like dependency theory has been sort of sidelined uh, intellectually. I think it's, it's good to go back to these, to these people and these currents of thought. Uh, and of course, um, in, in this specific case, like who can speak and who is heard with the refugee movement? Are their demands heard, actually? Do they, do they voice these uh, positions, of, um, and are they heard? Um, just a quick introduction to refugee um, activism in, in, in Germany. It started, uh, or I look at the, the early 90s, but it's of course part of a broader, broader um, um, migrant struggle um, in Germany. That's in the 70s and 80s, um, active as well. But in the 90s, a, a couple of self-organized refugee organizations um, were founded and were demanding their rights, um, especially against the camp system in, in Germany, refugee camp system, and uh, the um, so-called um, residency uh, law that um, made or prohibited refugees of leaving a certain area. Um, and that in, in 2012, um, this movement was sort of re reinvigorated because people started leaving the refugee camps in large numbers and uh, went to Berlin, defied the mandatory uh, residence law, and, and mobilized across the country. Um, and there were always two dimensions, equal rights, and, and participation in German society, but there was also the second aspect, and that's what I was interested in, is to, to look at how past and present inequal inequalities are, uh, of North and South, um, um, have what they have to do with the refugee situation. Um, 
And I think it's really important politically, also academically, to look at it because it has these political demands have been sidelined with the so-called culture of welcome in Germany, where again, where you had refugee activists in um, approached by the media to speak about racism and exclusion before. Uh, with the welcome culture, suddenly it was again white, um, sort of the white savior was uh, reinstalled, and you had more people helping refugees but not refugees as political subjects. So that's why I think it's timely to look at, to look at this aspect um, of refugee activism. I found two aspects, that, or two aspects I want to present to you. One is the, the critique of neocolonialism. And um, refugee activism um, in Germany um, has highlighted that for, uh, this for quite some time, but has sort of not been heard on this issue, I find. Um, and they say sing, the things like their countries are exploited and destroyed by Western industrial uh, powers, and that is why people are leaving, uh, and that they want to address this colonial continuity. And especially with uh, regards to um, Europe, European African relations, that's, I think, the main focus of, of the critique. Um, and also in the run up, this is uh, in the run up to the 2008 um, G8 summit in Heiligendamm. They really try to put a neo-colonialism on the agenda, um, and also work together with other groups um, um, to highlight this issue. And also, already in 1999, um, I think it was the G20 in Cologne. Um, they got no, the G7, sorry, the summit in Cologne. They got together with people from the Voice Refugee Forum, one of the biggest and longest uh, self organ uh, well, longest existing self-organized refugee organization. Got together with Indian peasants and marched to um, Cologne and was sort of part of this anti-globalization movement as well. Um, and what they highlight is basically this anti-colonial critique that the first world is the product of the third world, is the product of the exploitation of the third world, was what Fanon and uh, Galeano in uh, what Latin American context, what these um, uh, thinkers, which are of course part of movements, have always highlighted. Um, the, other, the second uh, interesting aspect is that they not only um, highlight exploitation, but they also crit criticize the development discourse. Um, and here you have um, organizations like Afrique uh, Europe Interact, uh, international network, also with, uh, in which uh, Germans, uh, German activists are part of. Um, the, they voice the, the, the double side, like freedom of movement, but also freedom of sort of de deciding what, they, what kind of uh, society they want, and they have put this into the, what sort of the slogan, the right to stay and the right to leave. Um, and I find this quite, they look at these two dimensions, that, and I find that quite interesting. And it links to um, sh this, this idea of um, sort of connecting um, uh, development in the North with reasons to flee in the South, so this idea of de-development comes up again, the need to also curb capital in the north, so they protest against the German bank and against land grabbing, and relate this to struggles in, for example, Niger or Burkina Faso for access to land. Um, and they also um, sort of try small things of, rep like of reparation, so sending, sending money, but not at, as aid, but as reparation. Uh, and then instead of, as Fanon put it, trembling with gratitude, such payments are seen as just reparation. Um, yeah, and I think this quote also put this, put this critique of the development discourse, um, um, well, it puts it out quite vividly. Um, the second aspect that um, I think might be a good contribution to the degrowth debate is their critique of imperialism and um, the export of weapons. And they've... Um, um, I crit criticized this for some time, um, and this is a quote by an activist from Berlin, it says Germany is one of the biggest um, manufacturers of weapons and military equipment in the world, and it makes no <coughs> sense for it to want to sell these weapons and equipment, so wars have to be waged in Africa. And then you look at um, actually Germany's role in this. Germany is the fourth largest weapon expo uh, exporter of large, or export of large arms, and second largest exporter of small arms and militarily involved in uh, several African countries. Um, and 
it's not only just criticized discursively, but also um, sort of put in practice this critique. And last year, um, a refugee, some refugee activists uh, organized the Bodensee Action Day, stop weapon export and fight the causes of flight. And this region in the south of Germany is uh, where many arms manufacturers are based. And they went straight to these uh, places and also made the link between refugee camps and arm, uh, uh, arms production. For example, they went to one small village or small town uh, in which 80% of the tax revenue comes from arms, um, arms production and there's a refugee camp. So people are housed in a refugee camp instead of in houses, which is the demand of the refugee movement and they try to really connect this and say your wealth, your uh, your um, prosperity is is linked to you know to why these people are here actually, and then you house them like that. So I I found these links quite um, quite convincing. Um, yeah, this is perhaps something that they don't bring up that might be interesting for the degrowth movement is that actually the military industrial complex is a big consumer of oil, but also part of keeping the fossil fuel industry going because it's about securing um, the oil fields, sort of. And um, yeah, this is something that might be a common, common ground or something that might help the degrowth movement to link up with the refugee struggle as well. Um, now I'll come to an end. Say, for me, in this research, it was quite, or looking at these issues, um, it seemed very necessary to draw on older traditions of, of, Western develop, of, of critiques of Western development, both from within Germany which seem to have been forgotten at the internationalist debates, but also from outside post-development anti-colonial critique. Um, and I think for the movement itself, and this has been debated at the, at the um, degrowth summer school, it's also like connecting these struggles is perhaps also a way of, of going, or sort of breaking up this exclusivity of the degrowth movement, which is still very white, at least in the German context, very white, middle-class, academic. Uh, and this was still the case at the degrowth summer school and at the climate camp, but refugee activists were invited and the topics were there. So I think it's like, a, it's a first step, but how to build these alliances is another question. And I think it has to do with taking part in refugees' struggles and not telling them, yeah, we sh you should be interested in degrowth because of this and that. No, it should be going there and showing them that you actually take their struggle as such seriously. And then once you work together, you might find common ground and perhaps, I don't know, have a campaign against arms exports, but for very, for, for different reasons. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I thank you and... Uh, Enjoying the uh, lunch downstairs. Join the crowd, yeah. 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 Just a clarification question. When you talk about refugees, are we talking about people who are asylum seekers or people who have been granted asylum? Because from the work we do with refugees in Greece, we see that there's a big difference in how they respond, connect, and, and work, whether they're still seeking asylum or whether it has been granted. Mm. Um, both. I think some of the very active ones nowadays have been granted asylum often. Mm -hmm. They're full-time activists now. Um, but these same people were active at the time when they didn't have uh, their papers. And I think this was really the 1994 founding of The Voice was a very crucial moment because they decided in a, ca in a, in a camp, a refugee camp somewhere, that they're not, no longer taking this. You know, they both, they're all depressed, all, uh, you know, in a really bad situation, say, we're just going to go out. And they defied the res residency law, for example, got arrested, went to jail for it, because they said they're not going to pay a fine for something that's just not right. Um, so they were actually, they put themselves into, in, in, in danger through their activism. Um, and I mean, the particular situation, that's the particular German situation that you always speak about refugees, because whoever comes to Germany and wants to stay has to say they're a refugee. They can't just say, 
I came here because I just wanted to have a look at this place. You know, people have been talking about the West. I just want to have a look. I'm interested. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we do when we go to other countries. We don't need any more explanation. But they have to say they are refugees. And some, of course, are refugees in the sense of having to flee political persecution. But sometimes it's just looking for greener pastures elsewhere. You know, just like probably all of us are doing. Academically, mm -hmm. all of us know how this works. We have to look elsewhere uh, to mm -hmm. find jobs, to, you know. And, but they always have to frame their issue as a refugee issue because that's the only legal um, way of, of staying in Germany. And I also think that many people don't understand in Europe. I mean, everybody thinks that all the Syrian refugees, they just come to Europe. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, our research shows that most of them actually want to stay close by. And when that becomes impossible, that's when they start coming westward. Mm. And of course, it's a class issue as well. Like you, you have to have certain funds to be able to come to Europe. Most people go to the next town or, you know, to the next place where that life is better. Yeah. I don't know you. Uh, should we collect question, questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, um, it was worth uh, missing the start of lunch for your presentation, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think two things which are really important about talking about refugees um, is that, uh, especially in Europe, it's, a, it's becoming a massive thing, like there's many more people who are defining themselves as refugees living in Europe. Um, and also the kind of agency of refugees, which many people don't talk about. And what we've um, found, we got distracted when we were doing our video making, and we started looking um, are at food issues in, in refugee camps. So <coughs> we, um, we kind of interviewed people about the food journeys that they've been on and kind of uh, came to the conclusion that there's so much waste. Like people are deciding to throw food away that they're given, which kind of goes against this myth that refugees are in need, they're lacking something, that actually they always have to take what's given to them. Because actually people are deciding, we don't want to eat the shitty food that comes from bad catering companies, we're going to throw it away. And um, instead, create little markets in the camps themselves, um, so that we have something that we want to eat. And so I think, um, in addition to your really, really interesting themes that you've already found, waste is a big, um, a big theme which could also be incorporated into your research. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's not a question, but um, I think I'm uh, really interested in your topic, partly because I didn't see a key on a similar set of themes, not just waste. So I wondered if you were aware of a similar comment in France through the 1990s and saw what in the movement. There's a really rich archive online of resources that they produced, and also books that were written after, uh, out of that struggle. And also there was, there was it's less well known, but there was also um, an, an emergence of an economic um, argument that they were making. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A friend whom I showed this uh, paper in the first first draft, she pointed me to that exactly that struggle. I think it's yeah. with a very particular, a, a different uh, history because they don't have yeah. they don't have to they weren't framing their struggle as a refugee struggle yeah. but as a migrant struggle. It's, so it's a different um, yeah, exactly. different struggle and also the the very obvious relation between the former French colonies yeah. and yeah. France. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of neocolonialism is is sort of a bit easier to establish in that context. But for example, m lots of the refugee activists in Germany are from Cameroon, and you also have that mm -hmm. colonial connection um, in, in Germany. But I'll have to speak yeah. to people to find out more about it. Mm -hmm. And Jacques Rancière, I know a French book here that was also written about the whole refugee issue, and that takes a sort of particular life politics. You mentioned you hadn't identified an economic and political aspect of the refugee issue. There's a very clear one in terms of the climate refugees, and uh, there, there's, our, there's some evidence that the uh, wars in Syria are caused for climate cause, or at least initiated. And I know in where, where we are in the States, we're having many climate refugees coming up from Latin America due to the extended drought that's been caused by climate change. And uh, climate, the, uh, also the exploitation of the Earth has, has created a lot of poverty in communities, so even the migrations 
economic migrations are in some ways related to ecological issues, to farm locations, and the destruction of sustainable farming and those kinds of things. So I, I like the way that you frame this in terms of degrowth, inclu including a, a transfer of wealth uh, from, the, from the rich north to the south as a way of helping the south to become more resilient to deal with the issues of climate change and some other things and, they, and resolve some of the, the, the issues that we've created through our wealth. So that's, that there is a very strong climate component there. There are famines going on right now in Honduras and places like that that are very good result. That's, um, we spoke about this at the, the summer school for quite a bit. There were actually like workshops on exactly that issue. And one of the things that came out is that framing um, migrants as climate refugees is problematic in sort of for the mainstream um, uh, circles because it sort of um, naturalizes it. Um, you know, it's like basically nature taking nature its toll it. and pushing these people, whereas it's never always, it's never only climate change. It's, yeah. it's exploitation, it's repressive regimes, supported maybe by northern elites. There's so many factors why people have to leave, and actually people in this um, network, Afrique Europe, uh, uh, um, Afrique Europe International, Interact, Inter 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 pardon, uh, they, they said that people actually don't frame it as such in, in their struggles. It's for, for access to land, um, of course, climate change plays a role, why, why the land is, for example, not as fertilized before, or why the rivers are lower. And, but um, they, they frame it in terms of exploitation, land grabbing, and um, yeah. So I was looking at the documents, but of course that link, link is there, but I haven't seen people in the movement taking it up. So that's, but that might be a way of, of course, forging alliances.